Okay, good morning, everybody. So what I'm going to talk about is some research that we've been doing in conjunction with uh, the African American Student Union 50th anniversary. So when uh, Dean Nithanoria asked Linda Hill and I if we would take over uh, this project, uh, we said yes, not knowing what that would mean. Uh, a documentary, a library exhibit, all this stuff. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to do as part of uh, this particular project is actually to use this moment as a chance to do a little bit of research and to better understand our graduates and to better understand what we can learn uh, about the experience of uh, black MBA. So that was really the motivating question, uh, was what can we learn about the career paths, the satisfaction levels of our uh, black MBAs? And this actually stemmed from some earlier research that uh, Nithin and I had done a few years back uh, for this book called Paths to Power. And in that book, we were trying to look at who really has access to opportunity uh, in the United States. <laughs> Does the Horatio Alger story really ring true? Can anybody with pluck and drive and determination succeed? And we looked at that from a lens of ultimate insiders and ultimate outsiders. And one of the outsiders, uh, and so there's a chapter about gender, there's a chapter about race, there's a chapter about socioeconomic status. Uh, those were a lot of outsider categories. And what we found is that for the outsiders, uh, that there were four paths to power. Uh, one was place, and so particularly for African Americans, it wasn't as if you could uh, uproot yourself and go somewhere else in the country. That was the path for some outsiders. You had the wherewithal to actually move uh, to a different part of the country, which was much more hospitable uh, to new business opportunities. You could have done that. Uh, for blacks in our database of great uh, business leaders, it was really serving their home community. How do we actually build a business within our environment? And so you see a lot of the businesses centered around the black community. Another was professional uh, networks, personal networks, how they leverage those uh, for opportunity, uh, professional credentials. One of the things that we found, which many of you have already found, is uh, the black leaders on our database were far more educated than the white leaders. In fact, this sort of path to get an additional degree, an additional credential, that was another path to success. And finally, perseverance. So of our database of 1,000 great business leaders that we compiled for this historical study, uh, 40 were African American, and of those 40 that were African American, there were six uh, African American women. All of them were entrepreneurs. Uh, in terms of uh, access and opportunity, there wasn't a lot of access and opportunity. And one of the things that we uh, found interesting was that there were four industries in which African Americans were concentrated. Uh, it was finance, uh, publishing and print media, entertainment, and personal and home care products. And so when Nithin came to us about this A250, I thought, I wonder if our MBAs actually are mapping to this particular path. So this was sort of the motivation of building the database. Has that changed over time? We looked historically at 100 years of history as part of this early research with Pass to Power, and I thought, uh, let's actually look at our MBAs and try to understand what we can learn about their particular Pass to Power. So our research methodology was to first build a career database. I thought that would be easy. I thought, or relatively easy to get the names. Um, I, I called admissions, I called alumni relations, I said, hey, can you give me a database of our black graduates? And they said, no. Uh, we have not captured that information until 1990, we've captured it from 1996 onward, we have no idea. Um, so I thought, great. So that was two years ago. Uh, and it's been a long process of actually building a database of uh, African-American graduates, black graduates of HBS, but we were able to do that. Um, actually, through some of uh, the resources that we had in Baker Library, we were, we were able to find a number of archival uh, data, uh, data sources uh, to be able to uh, construct this particular database. And with this database, we were able to create, uh, to uh, put in a lot of demographic data about who they are, where they're from, that sort of thing. And the other thing that we did is I went on LinkedIn and I actually pulled everybody's work profile and appended it to this particular database so we can see every position, every opportunity, uh, really to try to understand the career path. The second phase of the project was to analyze the responses from the black respondents to our um, life and leadership after HBS survey that was initially uh, conducted uh, as part of the W50 project. We actually uh, uh, through Robin's uh, effort in the gen gender initiative. They reach out periodically to our alumni, talk about 
asked them to talk about their career experiences and satisfaction. We did a survey in 2012, we did a survey in 2015, and we went back and analyzed that data based on the black respondents to try to s get a sense of what we can learn about uh, that particular deep dive into that. And then finally, we did a series of interviews with uh, black alumni and focus groups, about 50 different interviews about their careers and their trajectories. And so what I'm going to present to you is some raw data as we're uh, building this uh, particular uh, analysis. So for the data set, I can now say we have 2,274 alumni that we know about um, and in the history of HBS, the first one being in 1915, which was Wendell Thomas Cunningham. That was seven years after the founding of the school. Then between 1915 and 1968, there was a total of 42 black graduates that we've been able to identify. And so part of the ASU 50 in 1968 with six members of the class, that was the largest representation of black students in the MBA class, and that was the formation of uh, ASU 50. So we decided to look at the last 40 years of history from 1977 to 2015, and that's where we appended all this LinkedIn data, uh, Bloomberg biography data, and we were able to identify that there were 1,821 alumni, and we were able to get full employment data for 76% of that. So the data set is about 1,381 uh, that we're going to present some information about. We have demographic data on uh, the full 1,800, so I'll present some data which will represent the full spectrum. Uh, and then uh, when I talk about the career uh, information, that's going to really be about this 76%. So this is uh, a chart that shows the number of black graduates of HBS from, you can see, 1969 uh, to 2017. You see the big spike uh, in from 69 to uh, 70. Uh, the library exhibit that you'll see th later today is really uh, focused on these five founders of the African American Student Union who went to the dean and said, uh, we need more black uh, students in the MBA class. He said what a lot of people said at that time and probably still say today, we don't know where they are, we can't find them. <laughs> um, and and uh, the students said, no problem, we'll help you with that. Uh, and so with funding from the school, they actually went on a tour uh, to historically black colleges. They actually went out to uh, other schools as well. And lo and behold, they were able to increase the numbers. But you can see it's ebbed and flowed uh, over the last uh, 50 years, over the last about 20 five years or so, we've been at a mean of about 56 in uh, the class. Uh, in terms of the gender and country of origin representation, because I always get that question, is this just uh, black students from the US, is it others? Uh, it's gone up to about 43% of the class are women uh, as of the uh, 2010s. If I look at the overall data set, it's 35% women, 65% men, but it's up to about 43%. And the country of origin um, is shifting slightly, uh, where it was upwards of 95% from the US. Uh, by the 2010s, we've got about 10% coming from Africa uh, and a few other percentages coming from other parts uh, of the globe. But that gives you a little bit of background information of who they are. And then where they went to school. So we're interested to try to understand where our graduates uh, came from in terms of their undergraduate institutions. Uh, the blue bar is. Uh, the total, uh, the orange are female and the gray are male. So you can see the different representations across the different schools uh, where there's a big concentration in either Ivy League institutions, historically black colleges, or top 100 uh, universities. So not a major level of diversity in terms of who actually gets admitted. That's not surprising and I can share a little bit about uh, a comparison uh, analysis that we've done. If you're interested in uh, who are the top feeder colleges? Uh, so Harvard, I guess we like our own. Uh, so uh, is the top feeder college uh, over the last, this is over the last 40 years, uh, 50 years, because this date is from 69 to 2015. Uh, and you can see a couple of historically black colleges, Howard, Morehouse, uh, on that particular list. Coming in at 11 would have been Spelman, uh, if you were interested in where that is. Um, in terms of uh, the representation over the decades, this is where we actually see a concentration of admissions coming from more elite institutions. So you're seeing black students getting admitted to Harvard Business School coming from, uh, over time, more from Ivy League institutions. Uh, there's been an ebb and flow about historically black colleges uh, that's sort of uh, down a little bit now, uh, and then a big bump in the top 100. And you can see that's consolidating to where about 83 to 84 percent of our graduates 
black graduates in the last uh, decade have come from these three types of institutions where you saw historically this green bar uh, is, represents other public universities that's actually gone uh, down and this blue is the other private that has gone down. So more of an elite uh, uh, type of pedigree to actually be admitted into uh, HBS, which is one of the things that we actually found in Paths to Power was really who, where is the opportunity and if it's coming from education, who's actually getting admitted and is that n the new funnel in terms of opportunity and access and you can see it sort of playing out uh, here at Harvard. Uh, I've interspersed this with a couple of quotes from uh, some of the interviews, and so this is one of our, uh, one of the women that we interviewed, and she says, you look around at the education of black folks versus white folks, you start to notice a pattern that all the black folks are superbly educated. The black folks went to Ivy League schools, the white folks went to possibly wherever they wanted to go, uh, and you see that the black, goats, uh, black folks are screened much more. And she was actually talking not about HBS per se, she was talking about on the job. When she was at her job, she's looking at her coworkers, she's looking at her peers, she's saying, uh, why is it the case that all of the uh, black individuals I'm working with are coming from these institutions and uh, there seems to be much more freedom and access to opportunity uh, for whites from other uh, areas. In terms of majors, we're curious because doing the research and I was entering this, I'm kind of a control freak, so I actually entered most of the data, <laughs> Sadal knows that. Um, uh, <laughs> We teach together, I, I'm anal. Uh, so in, in entering all of this uh, data, I kept seeing all this engineering, uh, computer science and math, uh, and so it was curious to me to say, okay, what were the uh, majors uh, of our graduates? You can see a high concentration, engineering, computer science and math, business, economics, and then sort of uh, going down uh, over time. Uh, and you can see the shift here uh, again, over the decades, I know I'm going through this quickly, but you can see the shift. It's been pretty uh, constant, although uh, a, a growth in the business uh, degrees, uh, people coming in with business degrees. And what I wanted to do is to do a comparison of our black incoming students to the overall class. And we actually had comparative data for uh, 85, 95, and two, 2005, and 2015. And you can see from this data that there's been a big drop in uh, students coming in from the humanities, social sciences, uh, in terms of black students coming in, and a big increase in the business administration. The engineering, the natural sciences, that's pretty consistent between, um, so the, the spikes that I had saw, thought were there are, are pretty consistent with who's being admitted uh, overall uh, to the school. And now switching, uh, so that's a little bit of the background data, switching over to some of the employment information uh, that we have here. Uh, in terms of functional concentrations, we tried to understand what industries did our uh, black graduates, where are they concentrated in? Uh, finance, uh, about 35%, professional services, about 18%. Uh, that's actually a higher concentration than the class of, as a, a whole. Uh, so it was a bit surprising to me that more black graduates are going into the finance and professional services. Part of that may be that many of our black graduates, a higher proportion are sponsored by organizations who are sending them here. And so there's a responsibility or an obligation if they choose to accept that particular funding to go back to that institution. So there may be something going on with that particular uh, number there, but that gives you a little bit of a flavor of uh, so one of the things that we saw in our earlier research was finance was the key industry sector for uh, the historical leaders that we looked at. It continues to be the high, uh, highest sector here, although in the past it was really about insurance uh, and focused on burial insurance and looking at um, opportunities uh, for blacks and that uh, sort of covering the expenses for their life. Here it's more, it's a, a broader uh, perspective on finance, mostly on banking and uh, private equity. Uh, hedge funds, et cetera. And then we wanted to understand, okay, of the 1,700 graduates we know who are currently employed, black graduates, who is the top employer? And so the top employer is self-employed uh, and sole proprietor. So there's, the numbers are small, uh, but the thing that sort of struck out to us that 92 of our students, are, our alumni, are actually in the self-employed sector. And you can see the top companies, uh, Morgan Stanley, um, McKinsey and Google, and so it was a surprise to me that Google was number four, uh, and so I have initiated two additional uh, independent research projects with some students, one that actually has, is looking at 
looked at the self-employment uh, sector and actually interviewed uh, the, uh, a subset of the 92 individuals. Uh, and then I have another one that's going on now looking at our, uh, interviewing all of our uh, graduates who are at Google to try to understand uh, what's attractive about that opportunity, why are they there, what can we learn about uh, our graduates in that particular sector. But just a couple of thoughts on the self-employed. Uh, three hypotheses came out from that, from the, uh, the independent project that I've been working on. Is it a fact of a lack of opportunity and so they're leaving the workforce because of lack of opportunity? Is it because of desirable to create transferable wealth or is it to achieve uh, some sort of a work-life balance. And in the interviews that we have uh, conducted so far, we found evidence for the first two, uh, not at all for the third one, uh, in terms of, <laughs> which is probably not uh, entirely surprising, but um, some of the students I had working with me thought that was going to be a big lever, um, and they were sorely disappointed uh, when they saw there was no evidence uh, for, for that one. Uh, just one uh, quote about uh, this individual, uh, some of these individuals. I was tired, I was tired of having bosses. I was tired of what I considered to be unfair evaluation performance of an African American in the professional services industry. In professional services, you are sort of good because someone says you are good. African Americans never really fare well in that process. And there were many quotes like that. So some of them were, uh, you know, saying there's lack of opportunity, I'm not getting the shot. Um, I'm going to take this chance on my own to sort of go out. And what we've actually seen in the last 50 years, roughly 30% of African Americans actually are self-employed or a sole proprietor at some point in their career. They actually leave the workforce, they're doing something else, they're starting a business. Uh, so it's, uh, it sort of ebbs and flows uh, to between about 30 to 35%, which is um, uh, slightly higher uh, for blacks than the class as a whole, bec uh, and you see uh, our black graduates actually opting for that earlier than uh, our non-black uh, graduates. In terms of current positions, to actually see where they are now, we looked at these uh, 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 various individuals in terms of you know whether they were the C-suite, the upper management, uh, etc. And so the article that is in the HBR that you have in front of you looks at one of the things that we were interested in this was trying to understand who are the individuals that are in the C-suite, who has reached it and why, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but you can see there's a, a mix of um, representation across the different areas where uh, men are more highly concentrated in the top positions uh, than women. And this gives you a but not surprising if you sort of look at the decade of graduation, a higher concentration in the upper management, uh, which, you, which you would expect. Um, okay, three minutes. Um, functional concentration, the big takeaway, men are in finance, women are in marketing and strategy. Um, uh, and I won't uh, spend too much time on that. In terms of mobility, we were interested in trying to understand how many companies our graduates work for and how long do they stay. Um, little difference between men and women, although women tend to work for slightly more companies and have obviously less tenure based on the, the fact that they're working for more companies and trying to understand why is that the case and what are the reasons uh, for that uh, over time. And then the last part of the uh, presentation is really about enablers and obstacles to success. So I wanted to present a little bit of the data from the satisfaction survey where we compared uh, black respondents to uh, white respondents. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of the individuals that answered the survey in terms of direct reports and PNL responsibility, black versus white, you can see the data here. There were no real statistical significant differences in uh, this data except between on uh, uh, the PNL responsibility between white men and uh, black women, but other than that, uh, not a, a big um, difference. And you can see. Uh, on average, our black graduates are working for larger organizations uh, uh, than uh, some of the white counterparts, and we're <coughs> examining that as well. It's hard to read this in terms of the satisfaction by race, but we asked them about a number of different uh, areas, professional accomplishments, ability to contribute to society, and what we found is statistically significant differences between our black and white graduates in terms of opportunities to do meaningful and satisfying work professional accomplishments, and the ability to uh, combine uh, personal and career family. One of the things, so I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Uh, we looked at 14 different uh, factors that are potential enablers to success uh, and tried to understand 
uh, uh, how those played out in uh, individuals' employment. And what we found uh, is that the biggest uh, area of difference was significant uh, general aligned man management experience between um, black graduates and uh, white graduates in terms of being uh, the lack of access to that being uh, not being an enabler for them in terms of their success. You can see in here the blue bar is the number of graduates that have experienced that and the gray is how beneficial they believe it is. So you can see that in some cases not many have experienced significant or general alignment management experience but a lot of them, um, uh, the majority of them that have, have actually found it to be extremely beneficial. I just want to talk about one other final thing, um, which is sort of the impact on race on your career. So one of the things that we were interested in asking was, if you think about race, has that been an advantage, a disadvantage, or neutral in terms of your career? Uh, and we asked this for black and uh, white uh, respondents, and you can see uh, the highlight here is that uh, we asked them about leaving HBS, so anticipatory, when you were leaving HBS, what was your expectation, and then reflecting back um, how did you actually experience it? So what we see here is that black women expected their race to be a disadvantage and they experienced it as such. Uh, black men did not necessarily expect uh, their race to be as big of a disadvantage, but they still experienced it uh, to that particular level. So that's one of the things. Uh, and we have the same thing for gender uh, in terms of whether you expected that to be uh, an advantage or uh, a disadvantage here. So this is uh, in terms of gender, did you expect uh, your gender to be an advantage, a disadvantage, or neutral in your career? And actually, we asked uh, in our interviews, this was one of the questions that we asked several of the women. And so that led to this final project, and this is the last slide I'll show you, which is uh, part of the basis for the article, which you can read. Uh, through our analysis, we ended up finding out that there were 532 African-American women who graduated from HBS in the last 40 years and only about 13% had reached the C-suite. We wanted to understand why is the number so low uh, and also to learn from those 13%. So we went out and interviewed, uh, we requested an interview, we interviewed half of those women and the article talks about what we learned uh, from that research. So thank you very much, sorry, talk real fast. <laughs>